Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India So once again, good day and welcome to today's session on skin and fascia. This is Dr. Mauna Subaramaya, working as Associate Professor at Kempegowda Institute of Medical Sciences, Bengaluru. Skin, as we all know, is a humongous topic. So I will not be doing justice in saying that I will be covering all aspects of skin in today's uh, lecture. So this particular session is primarily aimed at overlying or broadly outlining the general aspects of skin and fascia pertaining to its functions, a uh, few layers, the cells, and uh, the modifications and general features of fascia. So let's begin the session uh, with a riveting activity. So I'm going to portray a few pictures. So you will have to tell me what is common between these pictures. In other words, find out the analogy between the following pictures. So here goes your first picture. The next picture is this. And the third one is this. So could you find out any common terminology which could connect all the three pictures? No? So here's a clue for you. The first picture suggests infection, that is herpes infection or herpes zoster, otherwise commonly referred to as shingles. So yes, so we are talking about dermatomes. So what are dermatomes? Dermatomes are segments of skin which are supplied by a typical spinal nerve. So when I'm talking about dermatomes, each of these pictures have a connection to this particular word. Of course, the third picture is just a portrayal of the dermatomes themselves, so it is self-speaking. Number 30 correlates to the number of dermatomes in our body. That is one less than the typical spinal nerve number because C1 does not have any cutaneous distribution. And the reason I put up shingles is the distribution pattern of this particular infection is based on dermatomes. It affects about two to three adjacent dermatomes. So with this activity, I think you are stimulated enough to proceed to the core of the lecture. So here we are. We will be talking about the skin or briefly introducing the skin pertaining to its functions, components, development, differences between thick and thin skin, the nerve supply, blood supply, lymphatic drainage, and a few clinical aspects. So skin as such is the biggest organ or the largest organ of the body. It is the largest sensory organ too. It contributes to about 16% of the total body weight and 8% of the total body mass. And if we have to talk about the surface area of skin, or accounts for about one to two meters square. And the thickness of the skin varies from 0.3 mm to three millimeters. Okay, so this is a brief uh, numerical facts in relation to skin. So coming to the functions of skin. So why do we need this protective covering? So like I said, the first function is protection. So it protects us from physical, chemical, and biological hazards. So it protects us from the UV rays, from acids, chemicals, and invasion of microorganisms. So it forms a nice barrier between the internal and the external environment of the body. The next important function is thermoregulation. This, of course, is more so in the lower animals where they are coated with a thick fur of hair. In case of humans, though the hair is minimal, 
there are other aspects which bring about thermoregulation like the amount of blood flow through the capillaries, the activity of the erector pili muscle which brings about the erection of the present hair uh, resulting in uh, conditions like uh, goose flesh and also uh, through evaporation of uh, sweat which causes cooling of the body. So in these ways it brings about uh, or rather plays a role in thermoregulation. The next important function of course is sensation. So in fact skin is the largest sensory organ and more so in humans because it is hairless rather compared to the lower animals and it is predominantly a sensory uh, in function more than the thermoregulator. The metabolic activities of the skin includes the production of uh, certain hormones, vitamin D and also the certain secretions which are poured out by the skin that is through the sebaceous and the sweat glands, they act as pheromones. So all these uh, uh, factors which are liberated by the skin bring about certain metabolic activity in the skin. There are some excretory function, unwanted waste materials are thrown out in the form of uh, uh, sweat. And last but not the least, identification. So we can identify a person based on its color, hair texture. So there are various modalities and fingerprints is the main uh, identifying modality which is used even by forensic experts. So uh, the dermatoglyphics which uh, involves the study of uh, fingerprint pattern, it is unique to the individual. So no two identical twins have the same fingerprint pattern. So in this way skin acts as a vital organ in identification of a person. So these are some of the general functions which the skin performs. So with this we'll move on to the structure of the skin. So these are the basic components which make up the skin. The first layer is the epidermis. So this is the outermost layer. It is a predominantly cellular layer with very little intercellular substance. The next layer is the dermis. So this is a predominantly connective tissue layer which is made up of a number of connective tissue fibers that is the collagen, elastic and reticular fibers and also has all the other components of regular connective tissue has. So beneath these two layers which are the primary layers of skin we have the hypodermis or commonly referred to as a subcutaneous region which can also be synonymously used as the superficial fascia. So all these three uh, words that is hypodermis, subcutaneous region or superficial fascia almost all mean the same. So they are present beneath the skin. Now associated with these two layers of skin that is the epidermis and dermis, there are a few other structures which are referred to as appendages of the skin. So what are these appendages? They include the pilosebaceous unit. So like the name suggests, it is made up of pilo. Pilo means hair, sebaceous, sebaceous gland. And there is one more structure in relation to this unit that is this particular muscle which is present that is the erector pili muscle. So all these three put together form the pilosebaceous unit. The next appendages where we are talking about is the one which is shown in green color and that is the sweat gland or the sudoriferous glands. And the third appendage is the nails. So this is all the modifications of these two layers. So they are derived from the layers of skin hence they are referred to as appendages of skin or the accessory units of skin. So let's talk about these in a little more detail. So coming to the epidermis, what are the layers of the epidermis? It has five basic layers. They are the stratum basale, stratum spinosum, stratum granulosum, stratum lucidum and stratum corneum. 
So these are the five basic layers which are present in the epidermal zone of skin. Now uh, I will not be going into minute finer details of these layers, I will just give you a brief overview uh, because uh, they will be dealt in detail in uh, histology sessions. So what do we see in the stratum basale? So this is a layer of uh, columnar or uh, high cuboidal cells which are predominantly mitotic. So they give rise to the other cell layers. So once uh, the cell starts in the basale, it moves through all these layers and finally it is shed off in the stratum corneum zone. So this a transition of, from the, of the cell from the basal layer to the superficial zone is referred to as an epidermal turnover rate. And this anywhere varies between 14 days like as seen in the forearm or uh, on an average it takes about 45 days. In case of this epidermal turnover rate is higher than usual, then it can result in excessive scaling which can lead to a condition called as psoriasis. Okay, so that is the mitotic activity which we see in the stratum basale. The next layer is the stratum spinosum. So as the name suggests, the cells here look uh, very spiny in nature or they have spiny processes or dendritic like processes. So why do we get this is be, uh, during preparation of uh, the routine histological slides, the cell contracts and uh, the edges of the cells, they are in contact with the adjacent cells through tight junctions. So these tight junctions are preserved and they give a spiny appearance to this uh, zone. This is also called as a Malphigian zone and uh, some authors, they consider the first three layers as the Malphigian zone itself. The next layer is uh, the stratum granulosum. So as we come from the stratum basale to the stratum spinosum, the cell size, uh, the height reduces. So it is initially columnar, then it becomes polyhedral, then it goes on flattening. So as we reach the stratum granulosum, it is a little more flatter compared to the spinosal uh, layer. And here, as the name suggests, the cells have typical granules in them. And what are these granules made up of? They are keratin granules. So when we are talking about these granules, we have to talk about a little bit about the keratinization process as well. So this keratin is nothing but a protein filament which is started in the region of the stratum basale. So cells here, they start producing the keratin which get aggregated to form filaments in this particular zone that is the spinosum zone. And then they are further aggregated to form granules in the stratum granulosum. And as we proceed more superficially through the stratum lucidum, they become more and more and they are finally shed off along with the dead cells of the stratum corneum and they form a nice waterproof layer over the skin. So this is called as keratinization, where the protein uh, keratin is being formed from the stratum basale and uh, finally reaches the stratum corneum. And if there is excessive production of keratin associated with excessive uh, epidermal turnover rate, we have the condition that is mentioned earlier, psoriasis. So this is about briefly regarding the layers of the skin, stratum basale, stratum spinosum, stratum granulosum, lucidum and finally the stratum corneum uh, where the cells almost are flat and uh, they are dead without any nuclei and they are present along with the keratin filaments. And uh, the, in the lucidum area, uh, the layers are, the cell membranes are very indistinct. Uh, there is a nuclei but they are very pycnotic in appearance. So this is a living layer but the cell membranes are very indistinct and this layer seems to be absent in uh, thin skin or even if it is present, it is present as a very thin zone. Okay. So this is about the layers. Coming to the cells which are present in skin, the majority of the population forms the keratinocytes. So these are present throughout all these five layers. They start in the stratum basale, go on to the spinosum, uh, accumulate keratin in more amounts and reach the granulosum, then their cell membranes become indistinct 
and they finally shed off along with the keratin and form the stratum corneum. So, these keratinocytes, they are uh, small polygonal cells with uh, few dendritic processes and they start accumulating keratin, uh, producing keratin and accumulating them as and when they transit through the different layers of skin and they form the majority of the population of skin. The next cell is the melanocytes. Uh, of course, this is responsible for the color of the skin and the number of melanocytes uh, is quite constant in different uh, sexes and uh, races. However, the pigments which are contained in uh, intracellular organelles called as melanosomes, those vary. So, the amount of melanosomes will determine the color and uh, the amount of melanin which is present will depend on other external factors as well like uh, uh, the UV light. Then also it depends on the amount, uh, I mean the nature of uh, hormones, uh, etc. So, various uh, factors will determine the amount of melanosomes which are present in these cells. And uh, melanin can be present in the form of eumelanin or pheomelanin which is responsible for the reddish and the dark brown uh, complexion. So, this is about the melanocytes and uh, again like the keratinocytes, these are also predominantly present in they are uh, having a dendritic processes and they are uh, predominantly present in the stratum basal zone. The next variety of cell is the Langerhans cell. These cells are uh, defensive in nature. In fact, uh, they are called, they are form a part of uh, skin associated uh, lymphoid tissue, SALT, salt that is called. Okay. So, they form an important uh, aspect of uh, the defense mechanism and they are present throughout the layers of the uh, epidermis and uh, they, their uh, processes extend uh, beyond uh, one or two cells. So, they have long uh, elongated dendritic uh, processes. And uh, these cells, uh, they have certain intracellular bodies called as the Langerhans bodies or Burbex bodies. Of course, the function is uh, yet to be known. And uh, these cells are primarily responsible for uh, conditions like allergic contact dermatitis uh, or they are also responsible for uh, graft rejection. And the last variety of cells which we come across in the epidermis is the Merkel cells. So, these are predominantly present in relation to the basal layer and uh, they extend their processes between the uh, stratum spinosal cells as well and uh, they are sensory in nature. Okay. So, these are the four different types of cells which we come across in the epidermal zone of the skin. Next, we will move on to the dermis. So, the next underlying layer is the dermis and this dermis has two layers that is the papillary layer and the reticular layer. So, the papillary layer is the intimate layer which invaginates into the epidermal layer. So, there is an interdigitation of the epidermis and the dermis. Now, the reason for this pegged like uh, attachment between the dermis and the epidermis is to prevent it from slipping off. If the uh, separation was uniform, if one layer was placed over the other, then there would be chances of peeling off the, of the dermis from the uh, epidermis. So, this peg and socket like of arrangement uh, will prevent it or increase the chance of uh, attachment between the epidermis and the dermis. So, that is the papillary layer into which the nerve plexus and uh, the other uh, blood vessels will form loops and enter. The next layer is the reticular layer. So, that is made up of uh, typical connective tissue zone having all the major nerve plexus, blood vessels and the connective tissue cells. And uh, in fact, leather what we speak about is nothing but a tanned uh, layer of the dermis. So, what is the dermis comprise of? It has cells that is the connective tissue cells which include the lymphocytes, the eosinophils, WBCs, etc. The fibers 
that is the collagen fibers, elastic fibers and reticular fibers. Now the collagen fibers arrangement in the dermis is uh, typical in fashion. So and they are arranged in regular bundles and in different parts of the body they run in different directions and these are called as Langer's lines and they form the basis of uh, many surgical incisions because if surgical incisions are put along these Langer's lines there is minimal scarring but if they are put perpendicular to these uh, Langer's lines then there is more chances of uh, uh, scarring and uh, delayed wound healing. So la collagen fibers in case of uh, dermis, they play an important role in uh, uh, this uh, cosmetic uh, uh, department. The elastic fibers of course uh, maintain the elasticity of the uh, skin and as age progresses the elastic fibers reduce in number and thus we have wrinkling of skin and so on. Okay. So the other components of the dermis include the capillaries and the nerve plexus. So this was about the dermis, that's the two layers, that's the papillary layer and the reticular layer and the different components which include the cells, fibers, capillaries and the nerve plexus. So this was the second layer of skin. So now moving on to the appendages of skin. So like we spoke about, there are three primary appendages of the skin. The first one is the pilosebaceous unit. So what is this pilosebaceous unit made up of? So this is nothing but the sebaceous gland, this is the muscle and this is the hair follicle. So all these three put together they form the pilosebaceous unit. So sebaceous glands they are usually associated with a hair follicle. Of course, we have a few uh, sebaceous glands which open directly onto the surface, for example, around the lips, uh, then in the genital areas, in prepuce, in uh, uh, clitoridis, etc. So here they directly open onto the skin, but elsewhere they are always associated with a hair follicle. Hence, they form a part of the pilosebaceous unit. And uh, each sebaceous gland is a cluster uh, of cells present as alveoli. Okay? And the superficial cells of these are flattened in nature. But as you go from the superficial zone to the inner aspect, the cells become more and more rounded. And the centralized cells, they are filled with secretions which are poured onto the hair follicle. So the secretion what they discharge is referred to as the sebum and it is very oily in nature and uh, it maintains the shininess and it forms a nice waterproof layer over the skin and hair. So that was about the sebaceous gland and this is a typical example for a holocrine gland. So what is this holocrine gland? It means that whenever the cell has to release the secretions, the entire cell dissolves and it releases the secretion by destruction of the cell itself. So that is referred to as holocrine. The whole of the cell gives out or pours out the secretion. So that is about the sebaceous gland. Next we have the erector pili muscle. So this erector pili muscle is uh, always in relation to the pili that is the hair and uh, like the name suggests it is erector. So it makes the hair follicle stand erect. So it is attached to the base of the hair follicle and the other end is attached to the lower part of the dermis. So when it contracts it makes the hair shaft stand erect. So it plays a very important role in thermoregulation and uh, heat control. Uh, so the, and uh, when this happens, we have the goose flesh appearance of the skin. Then the final and the most important part of the pilosebaceous unit is the hair itself. So the hair follicle, it has an outer component which 
uh, projects outside from the skin. This is referred to as the shaft of the hair and the portion which is embedded into the dermis. So, that is the root of the hair. So, in fact, all these uh, appendages which we are talking about like the sebaceous gland, the hair fall, they are extensions of the epidermis itself. So, hair is nothing but the extension of the epidermis into the dermal zone. So, this part is referred to as the root and this part is referred to as the shaft. The terminal portion of the root is enlarged to form what is known as the hair bulb and this is invaginated by the dermal papillae. So, this region is the invagination of the dermal papillae into the hair bulb. Now, if we take a section of uh, the uh, cross section at any level of the hair follicle, it is comprised of the follicle as such surrounded by an inner root sheath and which is in turn surrounded by an outer root sheath. Now, the hair follicle as such is made up of three layers. The innermost is the medullary zone surrounded by what is known as the cortex and this in turn is surrounded by a cuticular layer. So, the medullary zone is nothing but an aggregation of the keratin filaments with a few here, here and there uh, living cells. The cortex has less number of cells and in the cortical zone, uh, air bubbles start appearing as age progresses. So, it loses the color and shine of the hair because of these presence of uh, these hair bubbles. And outer to the cortex, we have uh, the cuticular layer which is nothing but cells, flattened cells which lie edge to edge over one another. So, this comprises the complete hair follicle. Now, surrounding this hair follicle, we have an inner root sheath. So, the inner root sheath is in continuation with the cuticle of the hair follicle. Then, this is surrounded by a layer called as Huxley's layer, which is about 3 to 4 uh, uh, layers in number. And this in turn is surrounded by a layer of cuboidal cells that is the Henle's layer. So, the, these three units comprise the inner root sheath. Now, external to this, we have an outer root sheath. So, this has again uh, a few fibers and uh, keratin uh, filaments and uh, outer to this, we have a glassy membrane which encloses the outer root sheath. So, in a cross section from internal to external, we have the medulla, the cortex, the cuticle, the Huxley's layer. Henle's layer, outer root sheath and a glassy membrane. So, this is the structure of a typical hair follicle. So, that again is a spilosebaceous unit. The next appendage is the sweat gland or otherwise called as sudoriferous glands. Now, each of these glands, uh, they have a coiled basal portion and an elongated conducting portion which pierces the epidermis and opens into the exterior. Now, there are two varieties of uh, sweat glands. You have eccrine glands and you have apocrine glands. Eccrine glands, they, uh, the cell does not alter in configuration while discharging their secretions and they are present in relation to uh, most of the areas and uh, it is predominantly seen in case of forehead, palms, uh, soles, etc. And uh, sweat glands are typically absent in case of uh, uh, wherever the sebaceous glands uh, open directly to the skin. In those areas, these sweat glands are minimal or absent that is around the lips, uh, around the, the prepuce, the genital region that is the clitoridus, etc. So, we were talking about the two varieties of sweat glands that is uh, eccrine and uh, apocrine. So, eccrine discharges uh, without any uh, disfiguration in the cell morphology, whereas in the apocrine part, this is the atypical sweat gland where the terminal portion of the uh, cell is discharged. So, apo that is the apical part of the cell goes off or uh, while pouring out the secretions. 
So, there are two varieties of these present in association with skin, eccrine and apocrine. So, this is about the sudoriferous glands or the sweat glands. The last appendage is the nails. Now, nails are nothing but the cornified uh, layer of the epidermis which are protecting the terminal uh, distal portions of the phalanx. So, they are the modified stratified corneal zone. So, when we talk about the nail, uh, we have a lateral fold, skin fold which covers the lateral aspect of the nail. Uh, then we have the proximal skin fold which projects or protects the proximal uh, portion of the nail fold that is the root of the nail. So, if we take a section of this uh, nail, we find this portion of the skin which projects beyond the root of the nail. So, this region is referred to as the nail plate and underlying this we have a mitotic zone that is the nail bed. And in fact, this region is the actual germinative zone which is highly proliferative and gives rise to the other cells. So, this uh, skin which projects over the base of the nail, this is referred to as eponychium. And this portion which is in relation to the free edge of the nail, this is referred to as hyponychium. And this is nothing but the nail bed with the overlying nail plate. So, in fact, this nail plate is nothing but the stratified corneum overlying this nail bed which is the stratum spinosum and the stratum basal layer. So, this is about the appendage nail and uh, we have various anomalies in relation to this nail like we have uh, spoon shaped nails in case of uh, anemia, we have clubbed nails in case of some respiratory diseases, then there is a breakage of nails which can occur that is referred to as oncolysis. So, there are various clinical entities just to name a few I have mentioned uh, one or two. Okay. So, that is about the appendages few words about the development. So, we have various aspects of skin which are developing from different germ layers. So, from the ectoderm, we have epidermis, the hair, the nails and the associated glands. From the mesoderm, we have the dermal portion of the skin developing and from the neural crest cells, we have the melanocytes. So, the only germ layer which does not give rise to any part of the skin is the endoderm. Now, just to mention a few differences between thick and thin skin. So, when we talk about thick skin, uh, this is the skin which is in reference to the uh, palms and soles and the rest of the skin which is overlying the limbs, uh, trunk, etc. they are referred to as the thin skin. Thick skin is uh, hairless whereas thin skin is hairy. So, we will list out a few differences between these thick and thin skin. So, the general appearance, thick skin is a little uh, uh, shiny and glabrous that is hairless whereas thin skin is uh, very uh, uh, thin to look at and it is hairy. The thickness of course, the, as the name suggests is thicker in thick skin and thinner in thin skin. So, the number of layers may vary from uh, 5 to 10 in thin skin to hundreds in thick skin. And the different layers, uh, all the layers are present in case of thick skin and uh, at a thicker rate, whereas in thin skin. Uh, most of the layers are reduced in size and um, stratum lucidum may be absent in case of thin skin. Even if it is present, it is reduced to such a layer that is it is negligible. The appendages which are associated with thick and thin skin are also very different. We find the pilosebaceous unit being associated with the thin skin. Uh, sweat glands are of course associated with both. And uh, we have a few speciality receptors which are more common in uh, uh, thick skin like uh, Merkel's uh, cells. 
So, these are more prominent in thick skin and also Pacinian scorpels are unique to thick skin. We do not find them in thin skin. Uh, in fact, thin skin is uh, having more uh, free nerve endings, etc. And coming to the examples, like I already said, thick skin is present in the palms and soles and the rest of the body is covered by thin skin. So, these are the few differences between thick and thin skin. So, this is the most interesting aspect of skin. So, we have innumerable uh, clinical implications in relation to skin. Just to highlight a few, I have pro I'm projecting a few uh, uh, interesting ones. So, this is a typical case of uh, burns. So, you can analyze uh, burns or classify burns as to various degrees in relation to the amount of skin which is being involved. So, if only the superficial uh, layer is inflamed with no destruction, it is referred to as a first degree burn. The next, uh, the epidermis may be lifted off and uh, it may slightly extend into the dermis. So, both these are various degrees of second degree burns and if it reaches the dermal zone or and much below that, that is the subcutaneous region as well, it is referred to as the third degree burn. And uh, in extreme cases, you can call them as fourth degree burns, where there is a typical charring of skin which can extend up to the bone. So, this is a typical case of uh, charring which was seen on a uh, post mortem. So, when we classify uh, or when we have to estimate the amount of burns, we generally follow the rule of 9. So, the face, the head and neck region has 9 percent, both the upper limbs uh, have 18 percent, that is 9 each, the front of the trunk has 18 percent, back has 18, the limbs are again 18 and 18. So, all that constitutes about 100 percent. So, roughly it is in multiples of 9. So, we cl classify or uh, assess the rate of burns based on this rule, that is the rule of 9. So, the next clinical entity we can talk about is excessive keratinization. So, we were talking about uh, psoriasis where there is excessive production of uh, keratin associated with excessive uh, uh, epidermal turnover rate. Okay. So, there is excessive excess, everything is in excess, the cells are produced in excess, even the keratin filaments are produced in excess. So, these conditions can result in conditions which can present as warts, corns or psoriasis which is very common in these uh, elbow regions or in the back of the neck that is uh, upper back region or scalp etc. So, wherever they are more uh, liable for friction the chances of psoriasis in those regions are higher. So, all these conditions there is excessive keratinization that is overproduction or turnover of cells and uh, overproduction of uh, keratin. So, what determines the color of skin? There are various factors. It is not only the melanocytes, it is also the amount of blood flowing through, then uh, the external factors uh, and the amount of uh, myoglobin present. All these will to some extent determine the color, but the mainstay is of course, the melanocytes. And uh, like I said, the melanocytes are mostly constant in number. It is only the amount of melanosomes which are present within the melanocyte uh, that determine the color. So, in case there are uh, zones of depigmentation. So, this is a typical case of uh, vitiligo where there are patches of uh, depigmented uh, skin. So, either the melanocytes are uh, not present in this region or they are not functioning. There is another case, uh, extreme case uh, uh, where there is total depigmentation of the body. The condition is called as albinism. So, here uh, it is an autosomal recessive disorder where uh, the enzyme tyrosinase which is present in the melanocyte is not active. So, there is complete depigmentation of the body. Now, this was deficiency of uh, production. 
when there is excess of production of melanin we have the other extreme. So, here we can have moles, navis or melanomas. So, melanomas can either be benign or malignant and they can be associated with uh, hair as well, even the navis also. They are uh, aggregation of these melanocytes in certain spots, even the freckles are also the same thing, aggregation of these uh, melanocytes causing uh, darker uh, pigmentation compared to the rest of the body and when they are associated with uh, hair that is the navis, it is called as a hairy navis. The skin can also be involved in certain infections and uh, inflammations. So, this is a typical example uh, where the skin is uh, infected uh, by the shingles or herpes zoster. And uh, like I said, the distribution pattern of these uh, infection uh, is uh, like a two or three adjacent dermatomes. So, by just looking at the distribution of these lesions, you are able to arrive at a diagnosis that it is shingles. The other infections include acne, which are inflamed uh, sebaceous glands and more so you find in the forehead, uh, around the mouth, etc. Okay, so, these are nothing but infected uh, sebaceous glands and uh, we also have an infection uh, by the lepra bacilli, uh, which can affect the uh, typical spinal nerve and cause uh, uh, sensory loss along the dermatomes. So, there are segmental sensory loss over the skin. So, these are some of the infections which can affect the skin and the other uh, uh, clinical anatomy related uh, structural uh, entities to skin are the squamous cell carcinomas, the basal cell carcinomas, etc. And uh, we can also talk about the skin grafts and uh, the skin grafts are being collected in skin banks and they are uh, widely used especially for burns patients as of late. So, this was in brief about the skin. So, in today's uh, session regarding skin, we studied that skin is a part of the integumentary system. It is the largest organ. There are two types of skin that is the thick skin and thin skin. The layers of skin include the epidermis and dermis. And the cells which are present include the keratinocytes, the melanocytes, the Langerhans cells and the Merkel cells. So, with this we conclude skin and we move on to the next layer that is the subcutaneous uh, layer which has the superficial fascia and the fascia beneath that that is the deep fascia. So, what is fascia? So, fascia is nothing but a band or sheet of regular connective tissue and it has many bundles of collagen fibers. So, it is present as a band or a sheet of connective tissues uh, zone which is made up of predominantly collagen fibers and where is it present? It is present beneath the skin, then it is present around the organs and it also is present separating the different muscle fibers. So, what are the types of skin? We have superficial fascia, we have deep fascia and we have subserous fascia. So, subserous is a very a minimal in a presence. So, it is predominantly the superficial and deep which we are concerned with. So, coming to superficial fascia, so this can be synonymously used with hypodermis or the subcutaneous uh, uh, region. The general features of superficial fascia include, so it is nothing but a layer of loose connective tissue with variable amount of adipose tissue. It is able to expand, it acts as a packing material between the structures. It acts as a storage area for fat and water. It also allows for free movement of the skin from the underlying structures. 
and it serves as a pathway for the neurovascular structures. Also, it plays a vital role in thermoregulation depending on the amount of fat available in the tissue. So, these are the general features which are common to superficial fascia in any part of the body. So, in fact, they are just acting as a packing material helping in thermoregulation and forming a pathway for the neurovascular structures to pass from the deeper structures to the superficial structures. Now, what are the modifications of these superficial fascia? So, in certain areas, it is ill-defined. For example, in the dorsum of the hands and uh, in our face and neck, they are all very ill-defined. It is well-defined in case of scalp, palms and soles. And it is very distinct in case of the abdominal wall, perineum and limbs. In fact, you can see stratification in the lower abdominal wall like uh, you have a differentiation uh, in the abdominal wall fascia, perineal fascia and in the thigh region. The distribution of fat uh, varies from either being absent or in excess. So, depending on uh, uh, whether you need uh, excess packing material. Uh, we have the distribution of fat varying in different uh, zones. And the other important entity in case of uh, superficial fascia is the presence of a subcutaneous muscle. Now, this pa paniculus carnosus is a continuous sheet of subcutaneous muscle which is present in lower animals. But in humans, uh, these muscles are left behind only in certain areas like the face and uh, palmaris brevis. Elsewhere, it is regressed. So, these are muscles which are do not have any uh, attachment to the bones as such. One end is attached to the skin. So, it is present in the subcutaneous zone. So, this is about the modifications of superficial fascia. Moving on to deep fascia. So, what are the features of deep fascia? So, this is a dense, fibrous, tough, inelastic connective tissue. So, superficial fascia was a very loose connective tissue whereas, this is a very dense, tough and fibrous connective tissue. It is devoid of fat and it is avascular. So, there are no uh, blood, uh, blood vessels which are going to supply this deep fascia. And it is richly innervated by sensory receptors. And how does it respond to the sensory input? either by contraction or relaxation, either by increasing that is addition or reduction of size or by changing the shape or remodeling or by change of composition. So, if there is any stimulus acting on this deep fascia, these are the four different ways in which the deep fascia responds. It can either shrink, expand, change its shape, etcetera. So, coming to the modifications of deep fascia, it is absent in the anterior abdominal wall. It is ill defined in case of face and uh, thorax. It is very well defined in case of limbs. And these are places where there is extra thickening of the already existing deep fascia. So, those include the intermuscular septa, which intervenes between the muscle fasciculi and gives uh, origin to the extra muscles. Also, deep fascia forms the coverings of the nerves, muscles, arteries and glands. In case of nerves, they form uh, different uh, levels of coverings like uh, the epineurium, perineurium and the endoneurium. Similar with uh, the muscles, you have epimyceum, perimyceum and endomyceum. It forms the tunics of the arteries and also it forms the fibrous capsule of the glands. In addition, it forms the tendon sheets and the fibrous flexa sheets. Retinaculae are bands of connective tissue or deep fascia which plaster the tendons at a point and uh, they prevent it from bowstringing. So, we have external retinaculae, flexa retinaculae both in upper limb as well as in uh, lower limb. We also have aponeurosis and uh, raphe, which are modifications of 
deep fascia. The other modifications include ligaments, these are structures which are connecting uh, two bones. We have interosseous membranes that is between the uh, bones like the radius and the ulna in the upper limb, the tibia and fibula in the lower limb. The other modifications include the joint capsules, the synovial membrane as well as bursae which are present in order to reduce friction. So, all these in total are nothing but modifications of deep fascia. So, like I already said subserous fascia is not a very important fascia compared to the other two fascia. It is just present in relation to the serous membrane as a thin sheet and it is more flexible compared to the deep fascia and uh, it contains variable amount of uh, fat and it is ill defined in the thorax, but well defined in the abdomen and pelvis. So, this is a very minimal fascia which is present closely in relation to serous membranes only. So, we do not talk much about this subserous fascia. So, coming to the clinical aspects or the clinical importance of these fascia. So, into the superficial fascia or the subcutaneous zone or uh, the hypodermis, several injections can be given uh, which require very slow absorption rates. Okay? So, wherever you require uh, a very slow and delayed absorption of uh, uh, drugs or hormones, we can inject them into the subcutaneous region. So, these include injections like the insulin which is regularly you given for diabetes the local anesthetics and also the low molecular weight heparin. So, all these require delayed and prolonged action. So, they are given into the superficial fascia. What about the deep fascia? So, deep fascia is important because it forms tough fibrous sheath and it helps in compartmentalization. So, this compartmentalization, it will limit the spread of infection from one compartment to another. And by localizing this uh, uh, source of infection, the uh, mass spread is limited. And also, uh, by determining which where the infection is present, uh, we can treat uh, like uh, if suppose we are talking about clavipectoral fascia, if the infection is below it will project into the neck, if it is present above it will proje project into the limb. So, by determining where uh, the infection is spread, we can localize the infection too. And uh, the presence of deep fascia limits or demarcates the infected zone from a non-infected zone and it limits the spread into other areas. And uh, there is also a func functional significance uh, regarding deep fascia because it is uh, surrounding a functional group of muscles like the flexa group of muscles are surrounded by one mass of uh, deep fascia which act as a flexor group as a whole. So, uh, similarly we have an extensor group. So, the kind of uh, functional uh, significance uh, is uh, provided by compartmentalization of different groups of muscles. So, this was about the deep fascia. So, in today's session regarding the fascia, we studied about what is fascia, the different types of fascia that is superficial, deep and subserous. We saw their general features and their modified versions and the clinical implications of these fascia. So, as a whole in today's session, we studied about skin, and fascia as a part of the integumentary system. And like I said before, I do not know how much justice I have done because skin is one big topic. All I have done is to outline the briefly regarding the layers of skin functions and uh, the modifications of fascia. So, with this we come to the end of the session and again I would like to thank the NPTEL Swayam Prabha team and uh, the coordinator Dr. Uh, Vijay Sagar sir. So, intellectual growth, it starts at birth but ceases only at death. So, with that note, we will end the session. Thank you. Have a nice day.